So this is a little abstract. Let me, let me give you a few examples of how this really gets used. So here is, in some sense, the, the simplest version of a um, <coughs> non-split uh, embedding problem. So Z4 has a natural map onto Z2. Remember, for the embedding problem, we assume that we already have an extension whose group is Z mod 2, and we already know extensions that have group Z mod 2 look like uh, adjoining the square root of something. So remember, we have the right roots of unity, so we can't be in character Z2. Um, OK, so I, I have this, this extension. I want to know, does that extension actually sit inside of a Z4 extension? It turns out that that happens precisely when the number D, which generates the initial Z mod 2 extension, is a sum of two squares inside of that. All right. So the two. Brouwer algebras are over at. Say again? The, the algebras in the, in the Brouwer. In the Brouwer for over at. Yeah, exactly. It turns out that those algebras will split when you go up to the field L. So these are, these are things that split when you go up to L. But yeah, they're, they're over. Uh, all right, I'll do two more examples. So these are slightly more complicated. HP cubed, the Heisenberg group. This is the non-abelian group of order P cubed that has exponent P. So there are two non-abelian groups of order P cubed. One has exponent p, and one has exponent p squared. So here's the one that has exponent p. It turns out that there is a sort of natural surjection of that group onto zp cross zp. And if you assume that you have the right roots of unity, then any extension that looks like zp cross zp is generated by adjoining two p roots of things that are sort of independent from each other, modulo p pounds. So it turns out that the embedding problem uh, in this setup is solvable precisely when, so I'm going to have to untangle some things here, precisely when you, you look at the, the first generating element, let's say, and that first generating element appears as a norm when you uh, look at the sub-extension that's generated by the second element. Okay. So this is what I mean when I say that they take these sort of algebras and they turn them into arithmetic conditions that determine whether or not you get a solution. Uh, there's actually an extremely similar setup for the other non-abelian group of order p cubed. So mp cubed is the notation I'm going to use for the non-abelian group that is exponent p squared. It also has a natural <coughs> surjection on the zp cross zp. Those kinds of things are still generated by the same, you know, you attach the p roots of two things. And it turns out that that thing has a solution. So the last case was when a was a norm, and now it's when the cpa is a norm. Okay, so it's very similar, but whatever. So an arithmetic condition that tells you when when this thing exists or not. So um, if you're an algebraist, if you study fields, these are actually pretty nice results. I mean, maybe you don't believe me for this one, if you're, if you're not crazy about norm maps of weird things. But the, this first one's kind of cool, right? It says that you know this thing has a solution exactly when something is rep representable as the sum of two squares. That sounds like number theory, right? So it, it, it's just basic enough that it, uh, you could pretend to tell your, uh, your spouse, and he or she would know what you're talking about. So that's, when that happens, I feel pretty good about life. Um, but there are some problems with this approach, uh, this Brouwer embedding problem approach. So one problem is that when you try to represent these um, obstructions in terms of explicit algebras, any time you change the gamma, when you look at a different extension, you just have to start all over again. You're, you're on a new hunt to find a new representation of that class. So everything is extremely ad hoc. And even when you have the algebra in hand, it can be very difficult to do the calculations you need to do to turn the vanishing of that obstruction into some arithmetic condition. Right? So there's some fairly heavy machinery that goes into using these things. So what we want to do is try to find a different approach. So that's what I'm going to detail for the rest of the talk. So what I want to do is go back to the whoops typo at least number two. Um, we're just going to look at the group ZP, not the group that's generated by the group ZP. Um, all right. So let's go back to the setup for the Brouwer type embedding problem. That means you just look at short exact sequences that look like this. Okay? Now, what I was saying before about embedding problems is that there's sort of a two-phase attack on things. First, you try to find an extension whose group is isomorphic to the kernel of the map, and then you need to worry about some stitching condition. Right? But I gave you some examples earlier in the talk where we classified exactly Galois groups that look like this. Right? And those were given by that object that I called J of K. So we actually, finding an answer to part one is really, really simple. What we really need to do is focus on finding an answer to part number two. What does the stitching condition mean in this situation? And in fact, I think we can really do something more. J of K doesn't just parameterize things that look like Z mod P extensions. It parameterizes things that look like elementary P abelian extensions, things that are direct sums of Z mod P Zs. So what I'd like to do instead is, is ask the question, 
Is it true that JFK encodes information about this sort of larger class of embedding problems, right? Not just the kernel being ZMOD P, but being a, a general elementary P abelian um, extension. Uh, the answer will turn out to be yes. Otherwise, the talk would finish now, and, and it wouldn't be a great talk. Um, OK, so let's think about this stitching condition. So um, suppose that I have a, a field extension L of K, and it corresponds to some FP vector subspace of J of K. <coughs> There's a theorem by Waterhouse. This is what Waterhouse looks like. By the way, it can be really hard to find pictures of mathematicians. As far as I can tell, this is the one picture of Waterhouse that exists on the internet anywhere. So here's what he showed. Uh, remember, L is an extension of K, right? It is a, a ZP kind of extension for K. But I want to know, is it an extension over the base field F? It turns out that L is an extension, uh, a Galois extension of F, precisely when the FP space inside of JK that it corresponds to is sort of well behaved under the action of the quotient. Okay? If it's closed under the action of Q, that's exactly what it means for that field L to be Galois over the, the base field F. And not only that, but it turns out that the Galois group of L over K is isomorphic to the dual of, um, of this FP space M under a certain perfect pairing that I'm not going to write down. And altogether, what this means is that if you're interested in looking at embedding problems, like the ones I just wrote down, then certainly, right off the bat, you know that um, studying not just the FP structure of JK, but really the FPQ structure of JK is very important. In particular, if it's going to be Galois, then the Galois group of L over F is going to be some extension of Q by this, uh, the dual of M. Right? So it sort of gives us a, a place to begin to try to compute what this Galois group can look like. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to focus on a very particular Q. I'm going to try to list all the extensions of Q by M dual. And then I'm going to try to figure out where on that list this Galois group sits. Okay. And then see what we can do. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on one particular uh, group for Q. And that group is going to be uh, a cyclic group of order P to the N. And sigma is the name for its generator. There are a couple of reasons I'm uh, focusing on this group. So one reason, remember I said the FPQ structure of M is very, very important. And it turns out that when you choose Q to be Z mod P to the NZ, then FPQ modules are fairly well behaved. Okay, so for instance, Every FPQ module can be written as a direct sum of cyclic modules. This is a very nice property to have. It also turns out that if you have an indecomposable FPQ module, and you know its dimension over FP, and that happens to be L, then automatically you know N is isomorphic to exactly this kind of um, FPQ module. So you really precisely know its isomorphism class based only on its dimension. Later on, I, I may actually use this module again, A sub L. I'll remind you about it then, but this has a fancy name. Another reason to like this is that it turns out that M and M dual are isomorphic to each other. Non-canonically, but at least they're isomorphic to each other, which is nice. <coughs> Remember I said that the Galois group is an extension of Q by M dual, right? So on the previous slide, that Galois group was an extension of Q by M dual. This just means I can sort of forget about that if I think about these as abstract FBQ modules. And then there's some other secret that I'll tell you about later, why it's nice to think about this particular value of Q. All right, so first step is try to find all the extensions of Q by M. So here's how this works. You take an FPQ decomposition for your favorite uh, FPQ module M, and you write down, remember I said every FPQ module is isomorphic to a direct sum of cyclic modules. So what you do is you take the isomorphism classes that show up in those decompositions, and you write down all of their dimensions, mu1 up to mu z. The one number that you're not allowed to write down here is p to the n. So you're looking at dimensions of distinct isomorphism classes for things that aren't free. So whatever, you're supposed to throw away P to the N for, for a reason that we'll talk about in a second. <coughs> then it turns out the number of extensions of Q by M is exactly Z plus 1. So I, I have some notation for these things. I can actually write down generators and relations. This notation is supposed to remind you that this group is an extension of Q by M. And these numbers that are underneath the bullet sort of tell you how to actually write down the generators and relations. So this is sort of, this mu number is this, the central invariant that determines exactly what class you're in. Um, if you're keeping track at home, you're only see things right here. So there's one more, it's called m bullet p to the n. And uh, so these are exactly the, uh, they're exactly z plus 1, and, and the notation for them is this. 
Um, you might be thinking, if, if I have a, an FPQ module M, there is one extension of Q by M that sticks out like a sore thumb, and that's the semi-direct product. And it turns out that this, this last group is exactly the one that's the semi-direct product. Okay? So these other ones are sort of the non-semi-direct products that could show up. Okay. So now we know what all the extensions look like. The next question is, how do I actually know which of those groups my Galois group is? So here's how it works. We have J of K and J of F. Um, again, if, if you want, you can just think in the sort of Coomer theory setting. So peak power classes of K map naturally down to peak power classes of F by the norm map. Okay, so there's a map that's induced by the norm. I call that N. Uh, there's also a natural inclusion. F sits inside of K, so P powers of class, P power classes of F have a natural map into P power classes of K. It's no longer an inclusion, but there's still a map. And I'm going to define a certain invariant. So if you give me an FPQ module, I'm going to define this number lambda of mu. And this looks horrible, but what you do is you take all the elements u, which have the property that um, they are killed by mapping them down by the norm and then including them back. But they aren't killed if you just map them down to the norm. Okay? So all things that sit in this kernel but not this kernel. You take that whole collection, you look at the dimensions of all the modules that they generate, and then you take the smallest number. Okay? This is sort of a strange construction. One of the things that's strange about it is that I'm using inf instead of minimum. It's sort of a um, notational cheat. It turns out that this set can sometimes be empty. And when this set is empty, the right way to interpret the enthemum of an empty set for things that look like this, it, it turns out is p to the m. Okay? So it, it's there. It just sort of magically works when you use n instead of min. So why is this great? So um, this is a, a theorem that basically Waterhouse proved, but uh, you can sort of ramp it up a little bit and prove it uh, and get something more general. But if you have an embedding problem that looks like one of the ones that I wrote down a second ago, then it turns out all solutions to that embedding problem are parameterized by modules inside of JFK, which is no surprise. Those modules need to be isomorphic to the kernel. Again, this isn't a huge surprise, because the kernel is dictating a lot of what goes on. And then the only other thing you have to worry about is this lambda invariant of u, and you want it to exactly match the mu that is keeping track of the sort of isomorphism class of the group. Okay. All right, so this is how you parameterize these things. So this is what I said a second ago. When this set is empty, the right interpretation for this enthemum is p to the n. And technically what that means is, if you want to know about solutions to this semi-direct product embedding problem, then you find all those things that have uh, this property with kernels. Okay. So it all sort of notationally works, even though it really should be split into two cases. OK, let me just give you a couple of examples. I know there's a been a lot of notation thrown on the board. Let me try to sort of bring this back down to the universe. So suppose that uh, the quotient group is now just z mod p. So it could be a cyclic prime power one, but let's just focus on z mod p. Uh, and suppose that the dimension of the kernel is 2. Um, for this example, I'm going to assume that p is also odd. OK. <clears throat> if n has dimension 2, then it's one of two things. Either it's a trivial module, so it's a direct sum of two fps, or it's this thing a2. Remember, A2 is the sort of the cyclic FPQ module that has dimension 2. So just think, this thing has a trivial action of Q and has dimension 2, and this has a non-trivial action of Q and dimension 2. OK. So if your module is isomorphic to the trivial thing of dimension 2, then either it sits inside the kernel of that map that I called N, or it doesn't. And when it sits inside the kernel, then the extension you get is exactly a threefold sum of ZP. And when it doesn't sit inside that extension, you get exactly zp plus z mod p squared. The other option is that u could be a2. Again, it turns out from the numerics, one of two things happens. Either this thing sits in the kernel or it doesn't. If it uh, doesn't sit inside the kernel, you get back the non-abelian group of order p cubed of exponent p squared. And if it does sit inside the kernel, it turns out you get back this Heisenberg group, order p cubed, but now exponent p. So this is great, actually, because it turns out that if you're interested in groups of order p cubed, you're really only missing one in the list. And you can't hope to get it in this list anyway, because it doesn't sort of sit in the right exact sequence. So this gives a nice, uh, a nice answer for groups of order PQ. OK, so this is sort of a nice theory for how embedding problems can get solved. I want to actually think about what it can do for us. Right? <laughs> so <clears throat> there are a few ways you can handle this. <clears throat> so one thing is, if you, um, if you happen to know the FPQ structure 
of the parametrizing space J of K. So if you could compute this thing for a specific field, then essentially all you have to do to answer embedding problems that look like G mapping onto Q is just do a little bit of linear algebra. So if you do the linear algebra, you can answer two questions. One, does my embedding problem have a solution? And two, you can actually count exactly how many solutions it has. Okay? This actually gets back to your earlier question, is this always infinity? Right? Is, is J of K always infinite? If it is, this second question has a done answer. Then the number of solutions will be infinite. Right? But if it happens to be finite, you can actually get back very concrete numbers um, that would be otherwise very difficult to calculate. So you can actually get some really nice concrete things. If you're excited about seeing real concrete numbers for these things, I can show them to you later. But uh, I won't break them out in general. Instead, I want to focus on a different question, which is the following. If it turns out that there is some sort of unexpected structural property that is common across all of J, K, so for every K, if J of K always has some kind of magical unexpected property, then it turns out that there is some magical unexpected property about embedding problems as well. Okay. So this sort of sets up the next slide. I wouldn't say this unless there were some magical property that were common to all of the J of Ks. So it turns out that the structure for J of K has been computed for all Ks. Okay? And it turns out that there are some things that are sort of unexpected that show up in this structure. <coughs> so on the one hand, um, if you look at the number of isomorphism classes of indecomposable FPQ modules, there are exactly P to the N of them. Okay? However, if you look at the module structure for any J of K that you like, there are at most N plus 1 isomorphism classes that appear. Okay, so there are p to the n possible things, and at most n plus 1 could actually show up for a specific field. And not only that, if you look across all fields, there are at most uh, 2n isomorphism classes that can show up. So the proportion of things that could show up over the proportion of things, uh, sorry, the proportion of things that sort of do show up over the proportion of things that that could show up, this is a very tiny number. Right? Most isomorphism classes simply do not appear uh, in the structure of any J of K. And not only that, but this invariant lambda actually takes a very prescribed form as well. Again, it could actually sort of be anything between 1 and P to the N, but it turns out that it has to look like one more than a power of a prime. Those are the only possibilities. <clears throat> and all this together means that the structure of J of K for an arbitrary K is really, really non-generic. It has some very special properties. So I want to figure out what these special properties actually give us in terms of specific embedding problems. So <clears throat> what does this highly stratified structure tell us about J of K? So one thing, it gives us some unexpected enumeration results for uh, embedding problems. And secondly, it gives us some sort of unexpected connections between solutions to embedding problems. So we're going to think about these two things. And let me just say that both of these get at that sort of question I asked earlier, which is, how is an absolute Galois group different from a generic profinite group? Right? Both of these things are nice answers to this question. All right. So to start off, we're going to talk about some enumeration problems. So let me give you three definitions. <coughs> so the number, sorry, this character n, you should be thinking new, and new is for enumerating things, I guess. So uh, nu of g of f just means you're counting the number of g extensions of f inside a fixed algebraic closure. Uh, nu of this embedding problem is really the same question, but now instead of thinking about extensions of a field, I'm thinking about extensions of an extension of fields. Right? It's the embedding problem analog. And finally, this last invariant, nu of g, this is sort of a funny one. This is called the uh, realization multiplicity for the group. So it's the minimum over all fields of nu of g of f provided that nu of g of f is greater than 0. And what this means is um, you take the group g and you say, suppose that you know that g shows up as an extension of your field f. Right? What's the smallest number of times that could happen? Okay. So uh, for example, um, you know that for finite fields, uh, we said before that the absolute Galois group is this z hat lattice. Right? So for every integer, there is a group whose, uh, there's exactly one extension whose group is z mod n. And what that means is, if you look at the realization multiplicity for z mod n, there are fields that have a unique z mod n extension. Right? And that means that for any cyclic finite group, the realization multiplicity is exactly one on the money. There is some field that has exactly one extension that looks like that. Okay. So let's count extensions over a base field first. So 
Here's a theorem. So if p is bigger than 2, and suppose one of two things happens. Either you have p squared roots of unity in your field, or your characteristic p. If either of these two things happen, then it turns out that the number of hp cubed extensions of f precisely dictates the number of mp cubed extensions that you have. This nice sort of simple factor. You just multiply by p squared minus 1, and all of a sudden you have that count. So this is a result that was proved in the mid-80s by Brodstrom. Um, here she is in Antarctica. Again, this is a warning. If you're willing to post pictures of yourself on the internet, someone may later use them in ways that you don't accept. Uh, okay, so this is a really beautiful theorem, but it has some fairly restrictive hypotheses here. Okay, either you have lots of roots of unity, or your characteristic is p. If we use this sort of module theoretic approach, it turns out you can actually drop those hypotheses and get a theorem in general. So uh, here's how this works. Inside of J of f, there is a particular subspace, which I'm calling fancy n. And remember, J of f, this keeps track of all extensions that look like z mod pz. Right? Inside of those extensions, there are some that embed inside of a z mod p squared extension. So n is the thing that keeps track of all those kinds of extensions. So if we, if we have this space that keeps track of those things, then it turns out that the number of mp cubed extensions of f is exactly equal to, well, so maybe this isn't such a big surprise, you get this kind of factor, like we had from Rochdam's result. Plus you get some correction factor. So it's the number of lines inside of J of F minus the number of lines inside of the space N multiplied by some factor that keeps track of what's happening over the base field. And the way these two results are compatible is the following. If you happen to be in characteristic P, okay, then it turns out that every z mod p extension embeds inside of a z mod p squared extension. So n is actually all of jf. And so this difference is exactly 0. If instead you happen to have p squared roots of unity, then it turns out that uh, every z mod p extension embeds inside of a z mod p squared extension. So again, this difference is just 0 on the money. But when you're outside those cases, this is sort of that correction factor. OK, so how about counting solutions to embedding problems? Remember that A sub L is the cyclic FPQ module of dimension L that's in decomposable. All right, so it turns out that you can precisely count the number of uh, split extensions that correspond to that module. So I know we are now, what, 50, 40 minutes into the talk. I've thrown a lot of notation at you. OK, this is not going to get better. <laughs> but bear with me. So, just think, I'm trying to count the number of solutions to a particular embedding problem, OK? The way that I do that is I first count the number of solutions to the HP cubed embedding problem. And then I multiply that by a certain factor, which is a little bad. So, but what's bad about it is, is just this extra factor here. So again, I need to know the number of HP cubed extensions. And I need to know the number of extensions that look like ZP cross ZP. If I had these two things, I just sort of plug them into this formula, and I can count exactly the number of solutions to this particular embedding problem. Not the prettiest thing in the world, but, but it works. Yeah, great. All right, how about some minimal realization multiplicity results? So remember, minimal realization multiplicity means um, what's the sort of smallest number of times a group can show up as a Galois group over a field. <clears throat> okay, so when p is bigger than 2, it turns out that uh, before we started working on this, there really weren't a lot of things that were known. It turns out that there is a field out there that has exactly p extensions whose group is mp cubed. Okay. And, and there's nothing that has smaller. If you want to know uh, fields that look like mp cubed cross zp, there's one out there that has exactly p squared minus 1. And then for hp cubed, there is a field that has exactly one hp cubed extension and, and uh, and so that means the realization multiplicity for HP cubed is exactly one. For magical reasons, you can also cross this by as many ZPs as you want, and it still works. All right, so if you use uh, the sort of module theoretic technology that I've been talking about, there are actually a lot more realization multiplicities that come out almost for free. So again, I know there's a lot of notation on the board, um, but just think that what I have here is a whole new class of realization multiplicities that I can compute precisely, and in fact, the way that you would prove this, like for instance, suppose I wanted to prove this second bulleted item right here. How many, um, you know, can I find a field that has exactly p plus 1 extensions whose Galois group is AL semidirect ZP? The way that you would prove it is you would find an extension that has exactly one HP cubed extension, okay? And then you would go back 
to this slide, and you would plug it into the formula. Okay? And when you do that, when the number of HP cubed extensions is exactly one, this turns into a one. You could prove for that field, this number also is a one. Of course, this number is a one. And what you get back is one over P plus P minus one over P, which is one on the money, right? Um, <clears throat> Right, so you can use that, and then there's some other sort of tricks that go along with it. This is really a solution to an embedding problem. This one is counting um, not solutions to embedding problems, but sort of the number of fields. So it turns out that there's this additional factor that pops up, so you have to multiply that one by a p plus one, because it's not an embedding problem. You're actually trying to find the number of groups. So um, anyway, there are a whole mass of these minimal realization multiplicity results that come out of this uh, technology, which is great. And oh. Right, I have 50 minutes and not 60 minutes, right? And we're at 51 minutes. So uh, let me wrap up. There are a few other things, but they all sort of take the same form. Because we know the structure of JFK, and because these JFKs can be thought of as sort of a parameterizing family for embedding problems, it turns out that you can find lots of surprising results about absolute Galois groups just by doing a little bit of, of linear algebra, which is kind of exciting. So thanks very much for your attention. Sorry that I'm a minute late. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so Brodstrom, and, and there's another um, mathematician named Jensen who spent some time doing this stuff in the 80s and the early 90s. And they, they, uh, when they prove, they're the ones that prove these results about realization multiplicities for NP cubed and HP cubed and so forth. And they did it very explicitly. So these are extensions of local fields, basically. They, there are some results that you can use that control the number of peak power classes in that context. Um, and they just sort of set up the game so that the peak power classes do some nice things. They also know sort of how to translate things into the language of, obst of obstructions of embedding problems. And so they just sort of set it up so that it has the right number of classes, and the arithmetic does what you need it to do so that the obstruction does exactly what you want it to do. So it's all very concrete, actually. So, so what's the difference between the two that's what's kind of magical about this, yeah. exactly. And in fact, when, when uh, Jan Menach and John Swall and I started working on this, we were really thinking just about peak power classes. And so then you, I mean, at least you can say, oh, I need peak roots of unity, right? And we got all this stuff, we got a lot of these kinds of things, and, and it all looked really beautiful. And then at some point, it sort of re it dawned on us that um, if, we just, if we just allow ourselves to change what J of K is measuring, depending on whether it has the right roots of unity or whatever, that this is really just a, a statement about modules. There, there's some module out there, and the module depends on exactly the setup of your field. But as long as you're willing to you know, pick the right module, there's a module that does all this stuff for you, regardless of what your field is. So for function fields, it would be too. So yeah. you could be constructing Galois covers and curves doing all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of. When I work on other things now, and, and I have to start a theorem by saying, let this, let this, take this hypothesis, blah, 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 I sort of think back to this stuff, and I think, oh, those are the days where it's like, let P be a prime. Therefore, boom. You know, like, it just doesn't take anything. So, yeah, it's nice. I mean, I guess you do need this Q extension to begin with, right? This is a module, and it's an FPQ module, so you need to have a Z mod P in extension. But once you have that, just it just goes. Other questions?